Welcome to Inside the Borough, the FAU podcast for and by FAU fans. Inside the Borough is presented by the FAU Owl's Nest. Follow us on Twitter at Inside the Borough. Hello and welcome to episode, I believe this is episode six of Inside the Borough. The FAU podcast for and by fans. Uh, my name is Dan. I am joined uh, tonight, uh, Shane, as usual. Jack's a little under the weather, so he's not with us. But uh, we have uh, a pretty decent replacement that we think you guys are, are going to like. Uh, the uh, color analyst for FAU uh, radio calls and former uh, FAU defensive captain, Chris Bartels. Thanks for being on the show with us, Chris. I appreciate you guys having me. It's exciting. Yeah, we're uh, really excited to have you and uh, kind of get your insight on in this year how it's going and maybe see uh, get your perspective on what you see. Um, things have kind of changed from this year to last year, but uh, we're, yeah. we're going to get into we're going to get in, uh, a little into the game uh, and, and this season. But I think it's kind of cool to uh, to hear how you uh, got here, uh, got to FAU, starting back in what two thousand and four, I think it was. And uh, you know, working on uh, from uh, yeah to uh, your way up. So, for those that are uninitiated who may just be you as the FAU color analyst, can you tell us a little bit about how you ended up at FAU and uh, you know, kind of you know, winning New Orleans Bowl and everything like that? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, this might be like the first time telling uh, my story of, of how I got here, uh, but it was 2003, graduated from Chaminade in Hollywood. Uh, in high school, I didn't, I didn't play much. I backed up some pretty, uh, some pretty awesome players who ended up going to the NFL and uh, wanted to stay home. I didn't have a scholarship anywhere. I didn't have bright futures. I wasn't a great high school uh, student. And I ended up going to FAU because my uncle lived about a mile off campus and he had an extra room in his garage. So it kind of just saved money and uh, it fit in. <laughs> I went in. I almost, I actually almost missed my first summer semester because that's the only way I could get into school was to try for the summer enrollment. And uh, my dad takes me up there, and we go to uh, Coach Nelly's office. And uh, long story short, Coach Guandolo down in Chaminade calls him and pretty much says, look, you're going to have a great scout team player for the next four years. So he'll do whatever you guys need. He'll be on the team. You won't have to worry about him. And pretty much got on the team that way. I tried out. Um, it was a 2003 year. I think they lost to Colgate in the D1AA yeah. championship. Um, I didn't see the field. Just scout team the whole time. Went to all the meetings, all the defensive back meetings. I actually played corner for the first year and a half. Um, red shirt freshman year. Uh, all the hurricanes happened. They went to Hawaii. Uh, went to North Texas, beat them, beat Middle Tennessee. That was the last year we beat Middle, Middle Tennessee. And then about midway through, wow. a few injuries, a few uh, – <laughs> yeah, I'm just time. laughing. If you think about it, it's the last time he won in Murphy's, bro. <laughs> yeah, yeah it, it's, it's nuts. It's nuts. Like, it, it's, it's, just, it's just bad. It's just bad. Um, but uh, long story short, from there, halfway through, a few kids got in trouble. A few kids got hurt. I ended up traveling and going to uh, – I believe it was – uh, FAMU, yeah, went to FAMU, played special teams, uh, then ended up playing special teams the rest of the year. Uh, red shirt sophomore year, that spring, a few kids got hurt, a few kids got kicked out of, out of the, out of school actually, and just the opportunity was there for me to kind of take a position, and I ended up converting from corner to safety in like the last spring game. And I guess the coaches saw enough of me there to give me a scholarship going into my sophomore year. Earned a starting spot. Started every game but uh, but one game, a Minnesota game, uh, my senior year that was at uh, Pro Player or Dawson Stadium now. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, so that's, that, that's my story. I walked on, uh, earned the scholarship, earned my stripes. Um, just try to fit in. A lot of, a lot of guys that, that were here before me, kind of paved the way for, for what the work ethic was supposed to be. A lot of the guys that came in before me were, were blue-collar guys, were kids that, that nobody else wanted. 
So they came in here with a, with a huge chip on the shoulder. And I just approached it the same way. And uh, things ended up working out pretty sweet. Yeah, definitely. And uh, I remember the play against so – I'll, I'll never forget the play against Troy where uh, they, were, they were marching down – and uh, to show that we won comfort or we won uh, the Sun Belt Championship, and that was a pass over the middle. Uh, and I remember, I don't know if you de if you deflected it, but I remember you were in the area, and then uh, you know jumping off the couch when we when we beat Troy. Yeah, no, I remember I remember the exact play because they would run. It was Holbrook, I believe the quarterback was. I think it was Mark like, Holbrook. Uh, Holbrook. Holbrook. There yeah. you go. Was he a left? He was a left-handed quarterback too, right? Yeah, he's a left-handed quarterback, but yeah. what they would do, they'd run, they would try to run speed option. You could tell by the trajectory of the pitch man then when it was going to be a pass. So he pulls back for play action, and he opened up to the near side, and there was a crossing route. And uh, a lot of film studies on that. But, uh, yeah, no, that was exciting. That was, that was I don't want to say more exciting to beat Troy that game for the conference championship than it was for the bowl game. But just playing Troy and beating Troy is just, yeah, them in Middle Tennessee. I can't stand those two schools, and I don't even want to talk about the school from down south. I don't. I don't even mention their name. Yeah, yeah. That, that was a. That was a. That was the, one of the like, greatest. One, one of the greatest moments. Like, like you said, it, it was pretty awesome. And Troy that year, yeah. they they were eight and four. They were dominant, and to to go to Troy, and yeah, it was pretty awesome. So yeah, yeah. It was. Uh, they always had good players, good staff, and uh, tough place to play. Yeah. Well, a lot of people don't know your brother played here as well, was a starter for a yeah. few weeks as well. <laughs> I mean, yeah, he did. How often does that debate rage on of who was better safety? Uh, honestly, it's between him and I, there's no, like, we never, like, there's no bickering back and forth. Like, you look at the stats and the stats say, say everything they have to say. Uh, but he had a similar path. He was, he was, uh, a star in high school for, for where he went, which is where I transferred from and uh, ended up walking on. And I mean, he was in the same situation. He just walked on and, and wanted to be a part of the team. He was on scout team the year, my senior year, we went to the New Orleans Bowl. And then he carried over the jersey and uh, earned a scholarship and, and started every game. Every game, I think, from his junior year, his last two years. So, so with one less year, he had, I think, like 80 more, maybe 90 more tackles than me. So, it says a lot about him. But we don't debate that much. <laughs> well, you, Matt, cool. how'd you, now, how would you get into the role you are in now? Uh, oh, so, yeah, that's a, that's a good question. I, I think right place, right time. Uh, whenever I graduated, I would always go back to the games and – and check out the team. And whenever I showed up, I was actually close to Brian Rowitz throughout my time at FAU because whenever they wanted to, to interview somebody, I was always available. It was uh, I thought it was pretty neat. I thought it was like a rock star. Now, now Nowadays, kids are like, I don't have time for that. Me, I was like, shoot, I'll, I'll talk on the radio or something. I'll talk to somebody. Uh, but no, I knew Brian from that. And then uh, Jason Pugh who was uh, a former defensive lineman, who was also the former uh, color analyst for FAU. He ended up getting a job, and they needed somebody to fill his shoes for the, for the next year. And uh, I went with JMP, who's a producer, executive producer up there at the station for 106.3, and kind of interviewed at a live football game. And it was at the swap shop over in Fort Lauderdale. And it was like one of those uh, – startup leagues where there was like five teams and these weird rules where field goals were worth like five points from like 50 yards out and all types of crazy stuff and I had to I had to interview with a live game from that and uh you yeah I kind of just <laughs> no, I didn't even know the rules I didn't know the rules I didn't have uh I didn't have like nowadays I have like a flip chart and things like that I kind of kind of got fancy but before, I would just work off of two deep, not even know any stats or anything, and ended up working out. And, uh, you know, every off season, try to reach out to a few people and, and try to try to get better at it. But right place, right time. I think it's been the story of my life, right place, right time. Yeah, definitely. I mean, it, it's a, I think it's got come so far. And I know after you went through so many – a lot of radio guys, and that's something like college football even nowadays. It's so – 
you know, radio announcers for college footballs are just so famous, you know, those Florida, Florida <laughs> Alabama, and, you know, I think yeah. you can have kind of, you know, it, you know, with all the rotation effort you've had, you and Ken have just kind of just hit it, and it's, you know, it's becoming a really good combo. Yeah, I appreciate it. Yeah, Ken is, yeah, Ken is a rock star. Uh, Brian Rhodes behind the scenes is like a mad scientist. Uh, I think it was that one of my, I think it was that one of my first years we went down to FIU and it started pouring in our booth and, uh, their ESPN broadcast, they were like, we're done. We were set up in a tent outside. Meanwhile, Brian and Ken, they're trying to make sure that the board isn't getting fried. So they're picking up these extension cords and power surges that are submerged in water and electrocuting themselves <laughs> while doing that. And at that point I was like, these guys are real. Like, I played football before, right? And I ran into people, but I'm not gonna I'm not gonna mess with electricity. I know better than that. <laughs> but they're uh Ken, Ken's great. Brian is a man. It's uh it's fun to be around those guys. Now as we'll, we'll kinda uh, it was kind of a transition question I'll ask here. Is it I imagine for me, and especially since you played at FAU, you know, this is your love and there's still passion is you find it hard, uh, you know, when you're in the booth and a two-point conversion play happens like it did this weekend, not to, not to show your emotion. <laughs> yeah, it, it's, it's hard. And uh, I think I'm in my sixth year doing this. And I would say my first three years, I would, I would, be, I would be a wreck. Like, like something bad would happen or, or we would lose or, or uh, you know, we let Wyoming drive down the field and, and lose the game in the last drive of the game or whatever. And I would want to throw myself off, you know, into the, into the stands, throw myself off the balcony. But then uh, I realized, look, I, I had my chance to contribute. I have no control over this. But the two-point conversion, I, 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 it, 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 it's tough. It's tough. I wanted to break something. There was nothing there to break. And uh, the emotion definitely flows. So I kind of have to keep myself in check so I don't say anything crazy on the radio. Uh, it, I, I think it kind of transitions, and you speak FAU history, and I, I think every FAU fan, Lane, Charlie Partridge, Howard Schnellberg, it didn't matter when Stockdale was rolling out and Late McCarthy was there throwing his arms up. Mm. Uh, Toss the ball in the air. I, I think every FAU fan knew a Middle Tennessee player was going to catch oh. it. Like, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, every it's, it's Murphy's <laughs> like... nightmare, like in one. I saw the Hail Mary flash before my eyes. I saw the uh -huh. the 13-point the 13 lead blown in two minutes a few years ago up uh -huh. there. I saw a quarterback running, you know, scoring a wide receiver at quarterback scoring 77 points. Just every nightmare right. scenario in Murfreesboro. Yeah, um, it's like one of those things where I look at Ken, I'm like, you didn't know that was going to happen, <laughs> you know, so it was, it was like, as, as much as I didn't want it to happen, and, and obviously, right, but there, there's just something about playing up there against Middle Tennessee, somehow they find a way to win, they have our number, period. They, I knew, we all knew they were going to go for two, Yeah. right? Yeah. Did we all know that? Uh -huh. did, did everyone know that? Yeah, I think, uh, well, off air, the question between us three up, upstairs was, well, what would you do? And we all were like, bro, we're, we're going for two. You're going against uh, the conference, the defending conference champion. You want to prove, you know, a statement. There's, there's no going back. You have a chance to win it, go ahead and go for it. So, and that's they, so they did for sure. What did, what did you think about the play, the play before that, the – they yes, they said he got in, uh, but to me it looked like his arm was down before the ball crossed over the plane, so it shouldn't have been. A Didn't look know. like it, it was. I I don't know, man. That that was. <laughs> so it's funny you say that. So for the past two days, I've been looking for the the pass play because Stock still has now twenty seven straight games with a passing touchdown. But he didn't have one against FAU, but they're counting some, some, some toss play as a pass play. So as I'm looking for this toss play, I keep on looking at the goal line play. And, I, Dan, I, I agree with you. I think, I think his, his left elbow hits, and then he kind of 
bumps off the ground and, and scoots his way into the end zone, the extra six inches. But what, what disturbs me is when they go to review it, they confirm the play as if there was enough detail on the replay because Conference USA and, and stadium, uh, the stadium uh, telecast was, was so awesome. You know, they have the pylon cameras and all that other good stuff. It is just a horrible view, and, and I think they, they messed that one up. Well, I mean, they're just – we're getting delving into something a little different here. There's just been issues with Conference USA. I guess today Conference USA came out and said they made an error on a contra- on a <laughs> interception in the old Dominion ECU game. Yes. We, yep. we you know, the, we saw with those targeting calls last week at UCF, that was a Conference USA uh-huh. crew. I mean, just – I just think it's lazy. I think he was down. I don't think they wanted to make that call in that situation. It was a lot safer to right. be like, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. It's it's unfortunate. Yeah, yeah. no, I've, it is. I think there was a number of calls throughout that game that uh, that could have gone either way, and they all went – it appeared that they all went towards uh, Middle Tennessee. And I'm not saying they're homers or anything, but – at the end of the day, the kids got to play the football game, you know, let them win or lose based off of their performance. Um, so, yeah, that call at the end was, was rough. The, the pass interference call, the offensive pass interference on, on the reverse where, uh, <laughs> where Kosar. I think that was just uh, bad luck. Well, you know yeah, what? Is... I knew they were going to call it because – but my thing is he extended his arm. If he doesn't extend his arms, you know – you know what's funny is I think that's the least call. I knew it was accident. It was accidental, but I, I think right. I didn't think that was a bad call. It was just more bad luck than anything. Yeah. yeah. Um, because I mean, he pushed the guy. I mean, and kind of yeah. by the rule, but it, it it really wasn't what it seems. I, I don't know. I right. Well, I mean, at, the so, end, at the end at the end of the day, honestly, if if a team has to count on a penalty. Or, or the officials for for the reason why they didn't win, then they didn't. Then they honestly didn't play good enough to win. That's 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 the honest truth. If you have to if you have to count on one call by an official or two calls by an official, mm-hmm. you didn't put enough good plays together in order to win the football game. So but, let's um, go go ahead, Shane, and then I'll. Well, I was gonna say the same thing with the quarterback sneak. I mean, everyone's like, "Oh, this play. Why do you run the court? If you can't push a team back a yard." I agreed. A hundred percent. You don't even need to push them back a yard. Push them back a half a yard, and usually the quarterback can do the rest. I mean, I, I agree. Game, but but I also, I also think Chris Robinson isn't the biggest quarterback either. You take a look at. I'm not saying DeAndre is a big guy, but Race Peavy's a a, a a big stout kid. You know, I think Robinson might be one one seventy five, one one eighty five max. You know, why not Why not have a package for a situation like that where you have your big kid just lean forward and just push the pile? Well, yeah, I think it's a bigger issue. I, mean, I, I we brought, want to bring you on and talk a lot of defense, but third and one and fourth and one has just been a mystery to them all year. Mm-hmm. Yeah, mm-hmm. Any okay. package. That was, I would say, you know, third, third and fourth and short. It was, it, was all, it was guaranteed for the most part. Um, so, you know, I was going to say, and we'll kind of kind of back up here and, and look at things a little bit more holistically here, uh, Chris. You know, so Shane mentioned the, the short and third and one has been this year. What do you think has been kind of a bigger, you know, what, what do you think has changed maybe uh, from year to year and, and is kind of leading to the, to the, the struggles of short yardages? Uh, I think there's a target. Well, I know there's a target on Motors back. So any type of running down, and, and, and we saw it, you know, third and 12 ends up being a running down for, for FAU right now. Um, you know, so short yardage got teams are, are, are stacking the box. Uh, you know, as a, as a former player, you look at the, you look at the, the depth chart, you look at the scouting report and you're like, this guy is not going to score on me. This guy is not going to get a first down. This guy is not going to do anything. He's not going to hit a hundred yards. Meanwhile, it takes, you know, Singletary 35 carries or it takes FAU to get him the ball 35 times in, in order for him to average, you know, three and a half yards per carry. So I think just the, the, uh, the, the mental toughness is not there. I, I don't, last year, 
the offensive line was finishing blocks. Hmm. The offensive line was finishing blocks. So they're, they're moving guys two feet by the end of the play. They're making sure that that, that defensive tackle is on their back. You know, they're, they're scraping up to the second level and making sure the, the, they're snapping the linebacker's head back. This year, they're great at pass protection, but there's no – as of right now, there's no – there's no fire when when snapping the ball. Do you, there's do you no there's it, no hunger. There's no toughness. No anger. Nothing like that. Nothing that I see anyway. Do you think it's a cohesion thing too? I, I think it was undervalued, and they weren't NFL players. But you know, you just I, I mentioned it today in the board. You, you look at someone like Roman Fernandez and Antonio Woods. I mean, those guys went to high school together, and they both redshirted. Right. Two guys that walked on, they went to, you know, a well-known high school in Palm Beach County, Seminole Ridge, great football program. Mm-hmm. We're talking about two guys who played O-line together for eight, nine years. <laughs> right. You know? Actually, it, 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 it's, it's a lot. I, it's yeah. hard to replicate that. And Pierre, on the other inside, was a senior vet, played with those guys for four years. I mean, you had – 15 years of guys playing together in the middle there, right. you know, you kind of trust the guy to your left and right, you know, there. Yeah. Yeah. You just trust them and you know what they're capable of. You know, they're going to have your back. And, and, and I do think the offensive line this year has had some problems with meshing and being a group and knowing, you know, the strengths and weaknesses, who's going to overstep on the gap and who's going to have your back and things like that. And I think they'll get better as the season goes on. Um, but you, like you say, you can't replicate what the the type of uh, connection the offensive line had last year. Yeah, and I think the biggest thing is is you know we always talk about the quarterback, and you could talk about this because you see it. But I think teams are just better prepared for us. Nothing we're doing is a mystery. But we, I think uh, that that's a hundred percent correct. It, well, at least from my standpoint, I don't want to <laughs> I don't want to talk for the coaches, but. It right. seems like whenever FAU dials something up, there there's something there that, that that's better in terms of the defense. Or whenever you know the defense has a, a run blitz dialed in, they're they're running a screen, which is gonna which is gonna kill the defense. And uh, I think it, it, it's almost predictable from the offense standpoint. The the play calling has been predictable. You know, you have a handful of plays that that's their bread and butter. Uh, nothing exotic yet. I thought conference play would have been, you know, you open up your bag of tricks a little bit more. You spread the team out a little bit more. You have a few plays that we haven't seen yet. But uh, everything that we saw on Saturday, we saw the previous week and the week before that and the week before that. I mean, even the trick plays. With Lane, it's all week. You know, as a DB, they're going to say, stay home, stay home. You know you're going to get two of these a game. Right. You know? Yeah. Our, yeah. our trick plays are expected at this point. Yeah, they might look different, but, you know, the, you know how it is. The coaches are say, yelling all week, stay home. Right. They're going to do reverses. Stay home. Be yep. smart. You know, like, it, it beaten into their head more than any other week, probably on the schedule. Yeah, uh, yeah I think to, last year there was a lot of trick plays as well. I would say decoy plays or, or whatever, misdirections, trick plays. And I think the tempo of the offense last year played into the ability for those trick plays to work. Because as the tempo increases and as you went on first down and you get into the second and medium, second and short, or the third and short, you open up the playbook to where you know that the defense is now on their heels, they're, they're scrambling to get a call, the offense is lined up, and they're able to run pretty much any type of misdirection or trick play, and it's going to work. The tempo this year has been – all right, let's hurry up. You'll, you'll see Willie Wright. You'll see uh, Singletary, you know, hustle up to the line of scrimmage. But there, th- that's it. There's no – if tempo is something that they've been trying to work on, it, it has to be quicker in order for those trick plays to succeed at the same rate that we saw last year. Yeah, it, it, but, you know, people say you want to go faster – but going fast is easy when motor's getting seven yards of carry. When he's getting three, five, right? As a defender, you stuff it. Okay, you know, you're not running back on your heels seven yards and trying, you know, as they're running up to line of scrimmage. If, if, if you stuff right. it, tempo's yeah. hard when you're not moving the ball. You how know, much, yeah. Chris, how much, how much do you think the, um, you know, and, and 
dig into some, some controversy, some people might say. How much do you think the play has impacted uh, being able to run the, the up-tempo off? I don't know. I'm not – it's – I think there's a, there, there's a give and take, really. I, it's – there's certain situations to run the up-tempo, and then I, the, the quarterback play is definitely a, a, a thing. I, personally, I, I think when – Kareth White, whenever he gets in the game, for whatever reason, his holes tend to be bigger than Devin's. Well, you know, and I, I don't know why that is either. I, I don't know. It's just weird. And, and we talk about that. How does how does Kareth White average, you know, eight yards to carry last game, and and Motor averages three and a half? I my I had a theory on this when he had a couple of good runs. We were backed up on that drive and he had a couple he banged off a couple like a, a nice 10 yard run then he followed up with like a 22 yard run i think right. Karen is a better just straightforward runner he's, he's yeah motor's right. gonna cut and be patient and kind of wait for something to uh-huh. hold, open and then explode you know then kind of almost like levy on bell type yeah, Karen yeah. Kind of just gonna go and ev- like every yeah. handoff is a kickoff return and i think yep. that almost fits the the way the offensive line's blocking right now, so it's like, right. well, if you just have someone go, and they're not going to open up a huge hole. And maybe I'm not. It's hard to see. Not you watch the tape. That's why you're on here. Yeah, maybe it's not the hole. He's just he's just running forward so quickly and just picking a hole and going. He's just so fast, straightforward. I mean, they say top three fastest on the team. He's just going, yeah. and it's just yeah, he's just outrunning people so much other that you know not really needing a hole to open up is, is kind of my theory on it. I No, I, was, I, I, I agree. I think uh, when he first got here, he was trying to make a lot happen. When him and Motor were battling for who was going to have the, the starting spot, he was he was that, that you know, shake and bake type of guy. He was the one to get a jet sweep and kind of try to make things happen in the backfield. But I think uh, Kevin Smith has done a good job. First of all, Karis White put on some weight. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think he put on like 15 pounds. He, he, look, he looks big. Yeah. Um, and like you said, just running downhill. I think you you said it. Third fastest or top three on the team with speed. He was a track kid coming out of high school and downhill, shoulders parallel to the to the goal line, and, and just score. You know, he's not looking for the. He's not looking to, to to make people miss. He's looking to to run people over uh, if he has to, but get to the end zone. But it's just it's just wild when you see Devin get as many carries as he does. And then Kareth White comes in and gets one carry. You're like, whoa, where was that hole for, for Motor, you know, two plays ago or whatever? Yeah. I don't know. I think that was an – Motor had 24 carries in the first half. I saw that and I said, what <laughs> right to do this kid? Yeah. yeah, 24 in the first half, 35 overall. Uh, the stat that stuck out to me was third down. Uh, I think going into the game, there were 120, 125 in the nation, offensive third down production. Jeez. And uh, we were three for three on that first drive at 15 plays. After that, we were six for 15. Wow. That's so game. three for 12 the rest of the game. So yeah. You converted just as many third downs throughout the rest of the game as you did on your first drive of the game. Crazy. You know, it's, uh, it's, 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 it's horrible, but yeah. I think there's yeah. de- definitely uh, – so we, we, talk, we talked a lot of offense, and there's certainly a lot that, that hopefully the team can figure out moving into, into conference play. But I know, uh, you know, I want to talk a little bit about the defense uh, because uh, it's been suspect at times. You know, the, I've kind of uh, – I think everybody's been critical. I don't think that they – and Shane said this earlier – that they didn't play terribly uh, against middle. They were left with a, a short field twice. And it doesn't matter. I mean, Stockdale, senior, senior QB, knows the offense, knows how to read a defense. He's going he's gonna to be successful if you give him the chance, especially in a short field. But what is, right. your, you know, what is your impression of the defense this year so far, um, you know, with the new defensive coordinator coming in? And it, it, seems, it seems as if they're not quite as stubborn on defense as they were last year. I, I, you know, what it was. Yeah. Oh, well, one of the one of the or every week they talk about team being uh, selfless, you know, laying down the line for the person next. You almost like cliche things that almost every coach says, but but they've been driving it with so much emphasis this early in the season 
that I almost feel like there's guys on defense who are trying to do more than they have to, which is force them to be out of position. You know, every everybody has a gap. It's gap sound football. You know, somebody has an A gap, somebody has a B gap, and so on. And if somebody tries to make a play and puts their hat on the wrong gap, that play is going to open up. Uh, so, but – with 10 returning starters, you know, you miss, you miss Jeremiah Teleni up front, but everybody else on the back end, it's, it's an experienced defensive crew without Raekwon Williams, obviously, but everybody else has returned and uh, Oklahoma is understandable. All right. You, you kind of get a mulligan for that as, as a, as a defense, you know, tough, tough to defend number one offense, but then air force, another tough game, but then Bethune, they're, they're converting, you know, 30 yards for touchdowns, you know, 25 yards for touchdowns, converted fourth down and, and 15 for a first down. And it's, uh, and it's disturbing. Yeah, things are going to happen, but so far, not great. I think they're still trying to figure out who they are as a defense. I think last year they had, uh, they had the stamp of the, their coordinators. And uh, I think this year they're still trying to work through a few things. No. It, it just seems to me, Chris, and maybe we get a little more X's and O's because I know people, it's, you know, people don't, especially it's hard to see on defense a change in schemes and not really understand what's going on and what's being, you, it, it just seems to me the defensive backs are just, they're just waiting to let stuff happen instead of right. just trying to make a play. You know, I, I know Jalen Young emphasizes that and is the leader of that second. He's obviously not healthy. Um, right. You can even tell it in his run defense. Where, you know, you know Jalen Young's playing his best football when he's helped off the field three or four times. Exactly. Yeah, you're right. You know, <laughs> because you know he's just going crazy and reckless and hitting people out there, and you know every quarter. So they got to go out there and be like, okay, get off the field, take a breath, and go back yeah. in. There. And you just don't see that with Jalen. You know, this year, and like I said, we know he's hurt, but it's just. It's just this rotation of guys. It's almost like people are kind of just scared to make a play. <laughs> but, I mean, yeah, it's, no, I, I, it's for as, for as bad as it sounds, and for as bad as it is as it is to say, as a former defensive back, you can't wait. The, the the one person who stands out to me is James Pierre, because yeah. it, I feel like every time the ball is on his half of the field, not even in his area, but his half of the field, he he's relentless in trying to make things happen relentless and I don't I don't know if I see that from everybody um, in terms of the overall scheme the X's and O's I, from from what I've seen so far there's been a big uh, emphasis on getting pressure on the quarterback and the way they're doing that isn't just depending on the the, the front four but it is lining up the nickel back whether it be James Pierre or Herb Miller whoever's going to be in there Carell Smith was in the first couple games and disguising who's going to come from what edge is it going to be uh, McCarthy from the other side or is it going to be James Pierre or is it going to be both of them and I think the lack of pressure on the quarterback is leaving the defensive backs with a lot of space to cover with a lot of time to, to, to be in coverage there's one thing for a quarterback to be sitting back there with, with only a four-man rush but when you're bringing five guys and you still can't get to them and, you, and you're still in coverage for you know three seconds four seconds that's a long time for, for a defense but nonetheless somebody has to make a play yeah, that's the frustrating part to me. And, and, and you know, I, I don't like the college kids. It's, you know, they're out there. They're not getting paid and stuff. But, you know, I just right. thought boundary guys have just underachieved this year and they had a lot of preseason hype and stuff. And it's just – I think maybe in this I, – I, I, we get – We've been, especially I know Zimbabwe, Tennessee, they attacked us on the boundaries a lot. They were going back shoulder. Yeah. I still think even – with the you know struggles on defense, it's not so much the middle of the field like UCF kind of attacked. I mean, it, where UCF even really attacked the boundaries. I think they're like, well, there's Rashad Smith, and they still have some pretty good safeties, but they're kind of just – it's more of like a man cover three, cover four, like we talked about on that boundary, and they're just yeah. saying, well, let's see if these corners can make a play. And it, Shelton Lewis yeah. and Tooley just – they kind of got to step up and just get get hands in there. It seems like – Guys are just beating them. Yeah, I think uh, this past week, I think Stockstill did a great job with the back shoulder. Those are nearly impossible to cover, uh, mm -hmm. especially when your receiver is running that go route. And, and the emphasis all week is 
don't get beat deep, don't let up the big play. Um, so you, you stay, you know, on their, on their upfield hip and then make sure they don't outrun you. But, uh, yeah, the perimeter game, uh, the corners definitely have to play better. I think the defense uh, calls have been – have worked to their advantage sometimes, but also has left them on an island to be exposed sometimes. Like, without a doubt, our corners can play with, with, with the best in the nation. But I think there has to be a uh, a cumulative effort by the entire defense to to shake things up for the offense. You can't have a quarterback sitting back there patting the ball, knowing that he has, you know, uh, two high safeties with with a cover two look where he knows that soft spot's going to be right behind our corner. You know, they they've checked. I think it was I, I could count maybe five six times where Stockstill came up to the line of scrimmage. It was three by one with the receiver set. And they went to the one receiver set, knowing that it was going to be man-to-man or cover four to where it looks like it's man-to-man. And, and sure enough, it's that back shoulder throw or, or it's the, the post or, or something, something to that nature. Isn't that a lot when you kind of get that three-in-one look for people that aren't it? And you get it, the three wide receivers to the usually the wide side of the field and you get kind of alone up top. That's it's a little bit of combo coverage, right? You probably have zone down there at the three wide receiver side and it's just kind of man on an island yeah. up top there. Uh huh. Depending on, yeah, obviously depending on, you know, the their splits and things like that. Uh, Middle Tennessee does a good job stemming their route. So going into the game, what they would do is, they're, you know, whether it was three by one or two by two with the receivers, whenever the ball was snapped, they would end up in line with each other and run their route off of a single line. That makes things a little bit complicated. But when you're in a combo coverage like you're talking about, to where somebody has, you know, inside hook to curl, somebody has outside curl to flat. If somebody has over the top of that is kind of your blanket coverage, things should be easy. Uh, the two-minute drill, the two-minute drill where they, they marched down the field in three plays and scored. The first the play. The first play they hit, yeah, the first play that they hit was a cover three, right, with three true safeties on the field. So you had, I think it was uh, Karan Hafiz in the middle, Jalen on one side, and then Gilbert on the opposite side. But your, your linebackers, there's nothing else in front of you. So chattering your feet at 12 yards or whatever it was isn't getting the job done. You have to sink and look for work. And the situational football, they didn't do it. They're, they're, they're killing grass. They were looking eyes at the quarterback. Yeah, you don't want him to run, but he's not going to run 88 yards and score on, on, on first down in a two-minute drill. Yeah. No, but he you know, so, dumped it in a 12-yard hole. Yeah, yeah, he dumped it right over the top of the linebackers. And if you sink just a little bit, that throw is going to be nearly impossible to make. And if anybody could make it, it would be Stockstill. But nonetheless, you want to shrink that window. So I think the the play calling has been there. For example, that play was, was a perfect play call. But just the, the situational awareness, it's a little bit different than when it's, you know, second and seven and it's a passing down. So, um well, uh, we're kind of running a little long here, so um, I guess uh, Shane, if you can kind of follow up here. But what is uh, what are you looking forward to for for the rest of the year? Obviously, you know the non-conference. You know, finishing that two and two is uh-huh. okay. You know, obviously losing against middle is, is frustrating. What do you, what are you kind of looking for? What do you, what do you think uh, the rest of the year might uh, might unfold? I think I think FAU right now has a big target on their back. I think the iron has been chipped. There's a crack in the iron somewhere. Um, again, I'm not in the locker room. I don't know what the morale is. Uh, but walking around and hanging around the lobby on the way trips and things like that, it seems like the spirits are good. But I'm just I'm just looking forward to the team that we saw last year, the guys that were hungry, the guys that wanted to block downfield as receivers, the offensive line who wanted to finish blocks, the defense who was ripping footballs out of running back fans. Just, just I want to see – this team have fun, and when they start to have fun, they're going to start to get some wins. So obviously, yeah. a little win bit more this game. one week. Yeah. So I'm just laughing about a debate that people are. Ha- you know what? This is a great question for someone All right. who played the game, and it's just been kind of debate. Some people on the board and stuff like that, and it was on TV where there was a instant where they came back I think it was maybe out of a timeout or the start of the fourth quarter we had the ball and they cut back <laughs> and, and they're all on the sideline and they're all jumping up and down no 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 Chris Robinson's on TV oh. 
he, he ran out onto the field and the offense is getting lined up. I don't even think the defense is out there yet, you know, coming back from the sideline, talking to the coach. I can't remember. Exactly. Uh-huh. And he's dancing. And, you know, I know people are just individually at the games where they see players on the sideline. There was an argument about the punter two weeks ago at Bethune was uh, or home versus Bethune was dancing on the sideline and he wasn't that great of a game. I'm of the theory. Right. doesn't. Matter. I want these kids to play loose, have fun. I think yeah. Lane said it today. Chris Robbins, his biggest thing is that he, maybe he thought he was pressing too much. So him dancing, but people have this dumb cliche idea that, Oh, he needs to be out there, serious field general, right? Like that—that's that's malarkey, right? Nah, that is I, I, I think every there's different players react differently. For you know, for for me, you know, I had I was focused, I, I was hype, I was intense after every tackle. And some players could go out there and make a tackle, and, and like Rashad Smith, for example, makes a tackle for a, a four yards loss, and it's like no big deal. Uh, Rusty Smith, back in the day, there was no dancing. You know, he was a field general, and that's how he operated. That's fine. I think players today is different. Players have the opportunity to put in the work all week. You know, they study, they prepare, they do all that stuff. Now it's game day. They know it. There's not going to be anything new, and if there is, the coaches coach them up. So having some fun, staying loose, it, it, it works for each person. Now if he keeps on dancing they keep on losing, I would say it's a problem. But <laughs> let, let them have fun. Let them play loose, and uh, everything will work out. That's what I said. I said, I, I think he's doing it to help himself. Like, okay, we got this. Yeah. Let's relax. You know, I mean, yeah. I'm out here. I got, you know, <laughs> I, I don't yeah, know. Yeah, he's not, I, I would, I would be, I would be more worried if he went out there and had no emotion at all. Like if he went out there, almost looked uh, hesitant, you know, scared, uh, you know, a little, a little baby deer, you know, behind the offensive line, but he does. And I think he does a good job taking control of, of the offense or has done, has done a good job so far. Uh, I don't. I don't think the dancing is a problem. Well, um, hey, we we really appreciate you being on. Uh, it's kind of cool to uh, connect with a former player and uh, certainly get your your expertise on uh, and your thoughts on the um, on the team. So we we really appreciate you being on here. Where can uh, if you know people either want to follow you on Twitter or Instagram or anything like that? Where where can yeah, they? Yeah, it's just. Uh... Twitter and Instagram, just my name, Chris Bartels, Chris with a K. I'm on there. Uh, nothing crazy. I don't. I don't have as much of a following as uh, Ken Lizdicka or uh, or Jack for that matter. But uh, <laughs> but yeah, give me a shout, man. I'd be uh, if you have questions, you know, go ahead and shoot. Appreciate you guys having me on here. This is awesome. It's fun. No problem. We can't let Ken get all the glory all the time. <laughs> Actually, it's funny because Middle Tennessee, there's a guy, uh, Chip Walters, who does their uh, their play-by-play. And then I've known him since I played. And uh, he called Ken on Monday, and Ken didn't call him back until like Monday night. But between that time, I ended up being like the next best thing to Ken. So because Ken couldn't do it or didn't respond, Chip was like, oh, how about we just get Chris? We could do that. So <laughs> you're right. Ken gets all the glory. I'm all right with that. They call him the voice. I call myself the whisper. We're okay. <laughs> so you guys got to even each other out in there. <laughs> well, well, he's always he, he's always pessimistic. He's always like, "Dude, we're gonna lose." Uh, you know, the field goal is not gonna go well. Uh, like anything bad that you could think, like, like really bad, he's talking about it. Man, and me and Brian are like, "Dude, what are you talking about?" Fourth quarter. Huh? Uh, but just, and I'm sure lots of outfits feel the same way. The text messages in the fourth quarter were just, I mean, oh yeah, you thought it was the Charlie Partridge <laughs> standing out there on the field. Like everyone knew what was about to happen. Oh, it was bad. It was bad. So bad news. Hopefully, hopefully this was the wake up call, kind of everybody that the team needed to, <laughs> to get into conference play and realize it's not going to be as easy as it was last year. So, um, right, right, for sure. Uh, we appreciate you being on, and um, we, I'm sure this uh, a lot of Owl fans will, will appreciate it and enjoy it. So, uh, for awesome. Cortez and uh, Shane, uh, I'm Dan, and we'll see you next week. And go Owls!